morning we have been discussing nucleosynthesis and in the last lecture I told you that nucleosynthesis does not proceed in thermal and chemical equilibrium. Nucleosynthesis is built up by a sequence of reactions shown over here. Finally, so these reactions start from proton and neutron and finally, it ends when all the neutrons that are available at the time when these reactions start off, all the neutrons get trapped into helium 4. Helium 4 is the nucleon with the highest binding energy per is the nucleus with high, highest binding energy per nucleon amongst the light nuclei. So, the reactions proceed up to here and then stop roughly. Okay. Now, uh, these reactions are not, so the main effect of these reactions is to take the neutron whatever neutron is available and put them into the helium 4. Now, these reactions are not perfectly efficient and uh, so as the reactions proceed the neutron density drops and as a consequence there are certain things which are the reaction rates become lower and lower they become less efficient as the reactions proceed because the neutron the the uh, number densities drop as the reactions proceed and towards the end you have certain things left over from the reaction which uh, do not finally end up in helium 4. So, these things that are left over at the end of this are deuterium So, you would actually expect all the deuterium to get combined to form helium 3 and then to go into helium 4, but this is actually not true. Not all of it actually participates in that reaction. The reaction rate becomes too low before that can happen. So, <coughs> some deuterium is left over, there is some tritium left over, there is some helium 3 left over, then there is some uh, beryllium lithium 7 left over and beryllium 7 also which is there at the end of this. So, in addition to the formation of helium 4 which is the which I have told you is the most <coughs> abundant of the nucleosynthesis products. So, uh, the abundance is given by this parameter y primordial, y is the abundance it is measured as the ratio of the weight in helium 4 by the total weight in the baryons in all the baryons and this comes out to be this is the observationally determined value the best observationally determined value 0 0.24 plus minus 0 0.0029. And so, roughly one fourth of the whole weight goes into is in is in helium 4. And uh, this I had also told you has a weak dependence on the omega baryon, which can be expressed in terms of the ratio nucleons per proton. And uh, that ratio which you infer, so the ratio which you infer from this helium abundance is given by this. I had mentioned in the last class that the error bar which I had written here was possibly wrong, it is not so, the error bar is quite large and you have this large error bar because the dependence on eta is quite weak. Okay, and this can be used to infer omega baryon h square, but the constraints are rather weak. Okay, so, the most abundant <coughs> end product is helium 4 one fourth of all the baryons by weight are locked up in helium 4. These are small amounts that are left over, which are left over because these re these reactions were not perfectly, were not perfect in trapping all the neutrons into this, some amount other things were but in very small quantities. Now, uh, what happens is after this 
after these things are left over at the end of nucleosynthesis, the H3, all the H3, all the tritium that is left over goes over to helium 3 by beta decay. And all the beryllium 7 goes over to lithium 7 by electron capture. So, finally, at the end of the day, you only have the deuterium, helium 3 and lithium 7. Okay, so, these are the light elements which are which have somewhat reasonable abundances at the end of nucleosynthesis in addition to helium 4. Helium 4 is the most dominant. So, let me show you the results of detailed calculations. So, this graph over here, the quantity, okay, let me explain to you the quantity that is measured. The quantity that is measured is the abundance ratio of deuterium to hydrogen, the abundance ratio of helium 3 to hydrogen and lithium 7 to hydrogen. So, these abundances have been calculated from detailed <coughs> reaction rates. So, you take these reactions which I have, okay, take these reactions and there will be further reactions which give rise to lithium and beryllium. And uh <coughs> then you have to solve these numerically along with the expansion of the universe and you will be left with certain values for these. These, okay, these depend, all of these, <coughs> okay, I shall come to the dependence later. Let me show you what the results are. So, the results are shown in the graph over here. This, the upper up topmost graph I hope you can see it. The topmost graph is deuterium to hydrogen. This has so amongst these, this is the helium 4, which is much higher. Okay, the topmost graph is deuterium to hydrogen, which is amongst these three the highest abundance. Then you have helium 3. So, deuterium, this is helium 3, and this is lithium 7, much lower. Okay, so, you have these three. Now, let us first discuss deuterium. Now, in the last class, I have told you that the whole of nucleosynthesis is essentially controlled by the production of deuterium. If they were in thermal equilibrium, helium 4 would have been produced first, then helium 3 and tritium and finally, deuterium because this has the least binding energy. But it is not in thermal equilibrium. So, these reactions do not actually start until there is sufficient amount of deuterium. The deuterium abundance becomes significant only when the temperature falls below the binding energy of deuterium, which is quite low. So, you have to wait and the neutrons all decay by then to a large to some extent. So, which is that is what controls the helium fract, helium abundance. Okay. But if you look at the reaction rates, it turns out that you do not have to wait that long. The, the subsequent this nucleosynthesis actually starts off at a value, if you compare the rate of the reaction to the Hubble rate. Hubble expansion rate, it, it starts up at a value where the deuterium fraction 
is given by this 1.2 into 10 to the power minus 7 divided by omega baggy on 8 square. Okay. And roughly this rate is what you get at the end of the day. So, this is the rate where the reactions, these reactions start off. This is the deuterium fraction, nucleon fraction of in deuterium where these reactions start off. What these reactions do is they convert the deuterium into helium 4, but this conversion is not, these reactions are not perfect. So, some deuterium gets left over. Okay. So, the what you see is that the abundance of deuterium that is left over is essentially inversely proportional to omega baryon 8 square. And you would also expect this because these reactions would be more efficient if the baryon density is higher. If the baryon density is higher, then the charging chances of these reactions taking place would be more if the neutron density is okay. So, so the abundances of these things that are left over essentially you expect them naively to be less if the baryon density is more because the efficiency of these reactions would increase if the baryon density is increased. Okay, and the abundances would be more if the baryon density were less. And it is also seen over here and you expect the, the value of deuterium abundance to be around 0. Point, so, this is what you expect for the deuterium abundance. Okay, it will get frozen at that value, that value will roughly around that value. Now, measurements, okay, deuterium we have already seen has a very low binding energy. So, it can be easily destroyed. The deuterium nucleus has a very low binding energy, so it can be easily destroyed. And inside stars, it is known that inside stars the deuterium all gets destroyed. All the deuterium gets uh, converted into helium H3. He3. So, deuterium gets destroyed, stars destroy inside, inside stars, the deuterium gets destroyed. So, any measurement of the, so any measurement of the deuterium abundance any measured deuterium abundance is an upper limit on the primordial value. Okay. And we have seen and I have explained to you already that the predicted abundance See, this is eta. So, as eta increases and eta goes from 1 all the way to 10 times 10 to the power minus 5, 10 to the power minus 10, sorry. This is in units of minus 10 eta. Okay. So, as an eta is proportional to omega baryon square, it is the nucleon per photon. So, as the omega baryon increases, the predicted deuterium abundance, deuterium abundance falls as we have already discussed. Okay. So, if you can measure the deuterium abundance, you get an upper limit on the primordial value. Why upper limit? Because some of it could have been destroyed in stars. So, it, it you get a sorry, you get a you get a lower limit, not upper limit. you get a lower limit on the primordial value, which means that the amount that had been produced primordially should have at least been what you see now. It could have been more, the excess could have been which you do not see, 
could have been destroyed in the stars. Stars we know when they first collapse and the nuclear reaction start, all the deuterium gets burnt off. Okay. So, what you see now could be less than what was actually produced primordially. So, it is a lower limit, it had to be more. Okay. And a lower limit on this d by h abundance implies an upper limit. on omega baryon h square because they are inversely related. Okay. Now, the question is now what are the various observational constraints on this how do people observationally determine this d by h ratio? Let me briefly discuss that. So, first is spectroscopic studies of the interstellar medium okay so we have when discussing galaxies i have told you that there is an interstellar medium this is gas between the stars in galaxies you in addition to stars you also have gas in the in the in between the stars this is called the interstellar medium ism interstellar medium and spect spectroscopic studies of the ism gives d by h to be equal to 1.66 1.60 plus minus 0 0.09 into 10 to the power minus 5. Okay. Next, so this, this is from studies of the interstellar medium. Then we have studies of the solar wind. studies of the solar wind okay so inside stars i have told you that deuterium gets converted to helium 3 but there is still some deuterium in the stars okay so you can now measure the deuterium abundances in the in solar winds. So, what are solar winds? There is plasma coming out from the sun continuously. Okay. The sun continuously, it is not that all the gas in the sun is contained just within the sun. Con the sun continuously emits out a wind. There is hot plasma coming out from the sun and this plasma propagates in the solar system our planet earth is actually immersed in this solar wind. So, we are continuously exposed to a wind from the sun. Okay, we are propagating inside this and this material coming out from the sun can pose severe constraints on for example, satellite communication or you want to communicate with some spacecraft. This wind activity it varies, it is not a constant. And when this wind activity picks up, it may pose a severe problem for communication because these are charged particles plasma and uh, they can actually stop the propag or disturb the propagation of electromagnetic waves. Okay. So, now what people can do is they can measure the abundance of deuterium and by sending out satellite or doing such, such things, the abundance of deuterium and helium 3 in the solar wind. 
and also in meteorites. So, one can send out uh, of uh, deuterium and helium 3 in uh, uh, measure the abundance of deuterium and helium 3 in uh, okay, the sorry the duty yeah combined abundance of deuterium and helium 3 in the solar wind and then you can subtract out the primordial helium 3 abundance. So, you can do this for both solar wind and meteorites measure the combined abundance because deuterium gets converted into helium 3. So, you can measure the you can measure this you can measure this primordial helium 3 abundance the difference between these two can be attributed to deuterium primordial deuterium. Okay. And uh, this can be done with the solar wind as well as meteorites coming on the earth. So, this gives you an estimate of the deuterium abundance in the material that formed the solar system and this the number that it gives you is uh, 2.0 plus minus 0 0.6 into 10 to the power minus 5. <coughs> Then the third method is Jovian atmosphere. So, if you do spectroscopic studies of the atmosphere of Jupiter, Jupiter is a largely gaseous planet made up of gases. So, if you study the atmosphere of earth you will get oxygen, carbon and these things if you study the atmosphere of Jupiter there people have measured. So, by studying this doing spectroscopic analysis of that of the atmosphere of Jupiter people have been able to measure deuterium to hydrogen abundance. Okay, so, you look for spectral lines from deuterium and hydrogen and you can apply the Saha annihilation formula to or if they are all in the ground state then you know from absorption lines what you expect. Okay and uh, this gives you a value okay so these are <coughs> methods which are relatively old and the error bars are not that accurate currently the most precise measurements come from spectra of quasi stellar objects So, these quasi stellar objects are referred to as QSOs or quasars. Okay. So, what are these QSOs, quasars or quasi stellar objects? Quasars, uh, so these are very small, so you cannot actually resolve them easily. See a star, what is it that differentiates a star from a galaxy in the sky or a nebula on the sky? The a star, what is it that differentiates a star from a galaxy or a nebula? So, until now we have discussed stars and galaxies. How will you distinguish between a star and a galaxy or a planet, let us say? How do you distinguish? How would you distinguish between a planet and a star? No, the size, angular size, right? Intensity doesn't discriminate because in the sky you can find as many stars as bright as Mars or Jupiter, right? Or comparable brightness, if not as bright. Okay. So what distinguishes is the angular size. For most stars, you cannot determine the angular size, they are suboxical. Okay, whereas planets they are relatively close, so you can determine they have a finite angular size. You can see them as disks. Whereas stars are essentially points, 
you cannot determine the size, the resolution is not sufficient. So, for a planet, this is a planet, your resolving power angular resolution is like this. So, it occupies more than one pixel. Okay, for a star, okay, the angular size is smaller than your resolution. Okay. Now, what people found that there were objects in the sky which had extremely small angular sizes, very quite bright objects, not, not as bright as stars obviously that you see, but there were objects which had extremely small angular sizes and uh, whose spectra though, for the spectra of stars we know are black body, roughly black body radiation, the spectrum of the star, sun for example, is very closely approximated by a black body radiation with a temperature 5700 Kelvin and we have discussed the HR diagram. So, the, 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 the spectrum from stars are well known, the, 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 the spec, okay, what kind of and they are, they are close to black body, but these objects they did not have any a spectrum that looked like a black body, they had a power law spectrum. So, the spectrum from these objects was a power law roughly. So, something like this, some nu to the power minus alpha, <coughs> okay, not black body. <coughs> so, these were called quasars, QSOs, okay, and it is now <coughs> quite well established and well, I mean, people generally accepted that these are essentially black holes which are accreting matter. Okay. So, these are believed to be black holes, very massive objects which are accreting matter. Uh, so, <coughs> these are actually essentially believed to be black holes or very massive objects accreting matter. And <coughs> the radiation that you would see is from the accreting matter, the black hole obviously will not emit radiation, the radiation that you receive is from accreting matter and there are all kinds of models okay, and radio and various observations have shown that there are jets coming out from these. Okay. So, now it is a very well developed subject, the one of QSO, but these are actually referred to as QSOs, quasi stellar objects because their angular size is extremely small, you cannot, uh, you cannot make them out, you cannot make out the angular size. Okay, they are very small like those of stars. Now, people have been able to uh, look at them and get some models. Okay, so, these are so these are QSOs, they have a spectrum like this. Now, when you have a QSO at some high red shift, then the intervening intergalactic medium, intergalactic medium. So, these are very interesting topics, but I possibly will not be able to go into it in any depth in this course. So, let me just at least discuss it to some extent. So, there is, so you have a, you are an observer over here and there is a QSO here at some red shift. So, these are all extra galactic. Initially, when they were discussed people, there was a great debate as to what they are. It is now well established that they are all extra galactic. They are outside our galaxy at high red shifts. Okay, at, at a variety of red shifts. So, they can be at all red shifts. Okay, you have seen people have now observed QSOs all the way up to red shift of 6, 6.5 over there. Okay, some of the highest for this known objects in the universe. So, you have a QSO at some red shift over here. It is emitting radiation like this, continuum radiation. This is called continuum radiation. Okay. Now, in addition to galaxies, you also have intergalactic medium. So, this is a diffuse gas, this is gas which is there between the galaxies. It may or may not be associated with some kind of a galactic type object, but usually you do not see it. Okay, what it is. So, you just see the gas and you know the presence of the gas through its absorption on the QSO spectrum. So, if you have some gas over here in between, then the gas will make its presence felt by its 
absorption on the QSO quasar light. Okay, so, if you look at the quasar spectrum, it is not going to be actually like this. What it looks like, I will show you a quasar spectrum later on, not today though. What it looks like is like this. Okay, there can be all kinds of lines. I am just drawing an artist diagram, but there will be all kinds of spectral lines, absorption lines on the quasar spectrum. Okay, so, these absorption lines are due to gases in the interstellar medium, intergalactic medium. Okay, and the study of the intergalactic medium is one is a very in use interesting topic in cosmology. Okay, <coughs> of great interest in cosmology. So, <coughs> what people have been able to do is they have been able to detect deuterium and hydrogen lines. And uh, from these lines, the the value that they get, the deuterium to hydrogen abundance. Okay, so this let me just tell you that the study of these lines is itself a very very interesting subject. People have classified the hydrogen lines as Lyman alpha. Uh, you get a Lyman alpha forest, damp Lyman alpha lines, etc. I shall not go into the details of this, but uh, as from for the deuterium to hydrogen abundance the value that is obtained is a 2.78 minus 0 0.44 plus these are the error bars uh, 0 0.38 into 10 to the power minus 5. <coughs> so, these are the uncertainties. <coughs> it could lie in this range, this value minus this and plus these are the 1 sigma error bar. So, this is the measured, okay, let me let me show you, sorry, I, I have skipped a little bit. So, these are the observations of 5 quasars. These have been extensively studied. Okay, it is not that just somebody does an observation. So, this is these are the observations from 5 QSOs, these are the numbers of these QSOs, QSOs all the QSOs have been numbered. So, they are these are 5 QSOs and for each of these QSOs these are the redshift and this is the deuterium to hydrogen abundance ratio. Okay, so, these are 5 quasars, the data from these 5 quasars were combined <laughs> to yield finally. So, these are a different redshift. So, you can see what the redshift range. So, this gives an idea also of the redshift range of quasars. Okay, quasars actually now have been found all the way up to redshifts of around 6.5. Okay. One of the, so they are some of the most luminous objects in the universe. Otherwise, you would not see them to a redshift of 6.5. So, <laughs> these are the abundances that you get and all these values finally, have been combined to get one value which is this for the prime, this is the primordial, okay, primordial deuterium to hydrogen abundance. And uh, if you convert this to eta, you are led to a value 5.9 plus minus 0 0.5 into 10 to the power minus 10. or omega baryon h square <coughs> 0 0.0214 plus minus 0 0.0020. So, this is the omega baryon, the baryon cosmological den the density parameter for baryons into this h square that is inferred from the deuterium to hydrogen abundance ratio from quasar absorption spectra. This is the most accurate determination from quasar absorption spectra. Okay. Now, <coughs> if you choose, so you have to supply the value of h square and you will get the value of omega baryon. 
Okay. So, h square h the value of h we know is somewhere around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.5. Okay. So, the uh, that is omega h square. Now, the observations of supernova distances which we have already discussed, observations of supernova distances, they indicate those observations we interpreted in terms of models which had two parameters essentially. One parameter was omega matter present, these are all the present values. Okay, so, omega matter naught, the other parameter was omega lambda naught. And we found that omega matter naught a value of around 0 0.3 was required, right? 0 0.3, 0 0.7. Okay. So, this is the total non relativistic matter, right? Non, it had no pressure, non Point 0.3. Now, for any reasonable value of h, you see that the omega baryon is much smaller than this. For any reasonable value of h, omega baryon is much smaller than this. So, omega baryon <coughs> So, this is the first evidence, one of the first evidence for non-baryonic dark matter. Because if the omega baryon had been much more, then the deuterium abundance should have been much lower. If you had an omega baryon which is comparable with this 0.3, all of the dark of the matter that you see, non relativistic matter, if it were baryons, okay, then the deuterium abundance would have been much less. So, this is evidence that the dark matter is not baryonic. To put this in context, let me explain what, what, it, what it means. Dark matter is matter which does not directly emit light. So, it is not in the form of stars or gas, they both interact with light. Right? If there were stars, you could see it, if there was gas, it would produce absorption or something like that. Okay? But the question is, is it baryonic or not? For example, you could have brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs are stars whose masses are not sufficiently high that fusion occurs in the center. So, Jupiter for example, is a is a planet, its mass is around uh, is, is, is quite high, okay? but it does not reach the mass of a star, it is a planet. Now, if I had a star whose mass were somewhat higher than Jupiter, it would if it collapsed, it would not. So, if, if the mass of Jupiter had been say considerably higher, then you would be in a binary planet, binary, binary stellar system, okay? but that is not so. Jupiter is massive, but not as massive, but it is still a planet, but if it had been somewhat higher, then it would have been a star, but the temp when the star collapses, the gas, the temperature of the gas increases due to the gravitational collapse at the center and fusion starts, but if the mass is not sufficiently high, there is a critical mass whose values I do not remember right now exactly. It is around 0.1 less than possibly 0.1 solar mass somewhere over there, but if the mass is not sufficiently high, then the fusion does not start. So, it is a star, but that there is no fusion. So, this star only energy is the gravitational from the gravitational collapse, it keeps on collapsing. This is called a brown dwarf. Okay. So, suppose you had many, many brown dwarfs, they would not emit radiation, you would not see them and this could be dark matter for one example of dark matter. So, if our galaxy for example, had in the halo many brown dwarfs, then they could be some dark matter candidate. Okay. So, I am just giving you possibilities, brown dwarf, okay. 
So very faint stars basically or you could have black holes, planets right planets or black holes also could be there. <coughs> so you had matter which had collapsed to form black holes suppose, okay, baryonic. So these are baryonic matter which collapsed, usual matter but they have somehow collapsed to form black holes like quasar or something but they are not emitting radiation anymore. So suppose I had such black holes all over the, the, the space, you would not see them directly, they would not emit radiation, but they would be exerting a gravitational force. So there are various such candidates which people have discussed for baryonic dark matter. These are the usual kind of matter that you see around us, but they have somehow gone into a state where they do not emit radiation and they do not interact much with light. They are also, they may be interacting with light, but they are so small that you possibly do not see them. Okay, they do not emit radiation of their own. Now, so this was baryonic dark matter, but this observation of the deuterium abundance actually rules out this possibility that if you had so much of baryon, then the deuterium abundance would be screwed up, it would be much lower. So, it cannot be baryonic, it has to be some non baryonic form, maybe neutrinos or maybe some neutrinos again have been ruled out we have discussed okay, to some extent, but uh, it could be some exotic particles from predicted by st particle theory. Okay. There is another possibility if they are baryons, then these baryons somehow we have to contain them before nucleosynthesis started. If you could make objects from the, these baryons which do not, so suppose you can make some kind of objects with these baryons before nucleosynthesis occurred then this baryon would not be available for nucleosynthesis, okay, but that is again a very exotic possibility. So typically we take them as this observation as indication that the dark matter is non-baryonic okay, and it comes from this. Now there are more, much more precise, there are uh, most, pre most precise observations come from anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Let me just mention this. Now, so these put the uh, the the most uh, stringent uh, constraints on uh, omega baryon eight square and the values that it predicts. Uh, So this is the omega baryon 8 square value which people determine from anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background radiation and uh, omega matter 8 square, this value from cos same observations So what this indicates is that the there is a discrepancy of, of the of 5 to 6 times difference, okay. 5 to 6 times. So the total matter is 5 to 6 times more than the baryonic matter. Okay. So you have a need for non-baryonic dark matter. Okay. And this is one of the biggest, uh, very big challenges to uh, cosmology to determine the nature of the dark matter. So there could be some uh, particle physics, <coughs> there are different models of particle physics that predict all kinds of particles, non-baryonic particles, non which do not interact with radiation, which are very weak interactions with radiation. Uh, but unfortunately, no such particle, I mean these particles have, I mean there is, no, there are many candidates, but there is no clear picture as to what is really is the dark matter, uh, what really makes up the dark matter that we have. Okay. Now let us sh shift our attention to the helium-3 abundance.
Okay. Now, again helium 3 abundance is less than the deuterium abundance and uh, it again it also falls monotonically as you increase the value of eta. Okay, so, as you increase the value of eta, the helium 3 abundance also falls monotonically. The abundances are uh, somewhat smaller than the deuterium abundance and uh, <coughs> the complication with the helium 3 abundance is that helium 3 is both destroyed and produced in stars. So, deuterium abundance the interpretation was relatively simpler uh, because it is only destroyed. So, whatever you measure is a lower limit it could be the primordial abundance could have been more than that, but helium 3 we have already seen deuterium gets converted into helium 3. So, it is produced as well as destroyed both these processes occur. We have already seen how it is destroyed helium 3 for example, <coughs> could combine with a neutron and uh, you would get helium 4. Okay, that is one reaction which we have discussed. It is also destroyed we are produced we have also seen one reaction deuterium can get <coughs> converted to helium 3 okay, by fusion which we have already seen. So, both of these processes can occur. So, it is not so straightforward to interpret uh, what you actually observe. Okay. Now, there are observations of H 2 regions again I have mentioned what these are the galactic H 2 regions these are regions of ionized gas and there are also planetary nebulae planetary nebulae. These are gaseous envelopes around stars which form around stars and uh, they have uh, strong emission lines. So, uh, from observations of H 2 regions and planetary nebulae people have obtained uh, estimates of uh, H 3 abundance as a ratio H 3 hydrogen and uh, this is uh, less than And these observations they uh, imply omega baryon h square has a value zero point zero two one four. Okay. So, that is helium 3 abundance. The next thing that one could look at is lithium, lithium 7 there is also lithium 6 that is produced. So, lithium 6 the abundances are extremely small and they are really not uh, they do not impose any uh, not considered for imp uh, imposing cosmological constraints, but lithium uh, 7 does impose cosmological constraints. The, uh, the dependence of lithium 7 on omega baryon on h square is or on eta is a little more complicated. You see that it has uh, it goes up when you decrease the it does not decrease monotonically it uh, decrease it does decrease and then again it shoots up. Okay. I will uh, not go into the details of, of this of this observation I will request you to have a look at it uh, for yourself. Okay. So, I am not going to take up the details of this lithium 7 uh, abundance what determines it etcetera. So, <coughs> this brings us to a close of uh, the discussion of, uh, of nucleosynthesis.
So, what we have seen, let me just briefly summarize. So, what we have seen is that the neutrons play a very crucial role in this whole thing of nucleosynthesis. Nucleosynthesis occurs essentially is determined by the amount of neutrons that is left, the abundance of neutron that is left at the instant at the time when this whole chain of reactions is set off. Okay. This whole thing is controlled by the deuterium abundance and the deuterium abundance is when the deuterium abundance reaches a critical value when the whole reaction chain of reaction starts off, then the deuterium abundance at that instant is also basically determined by the neutron the neutron abundance and the neutrons we know that they are maintained in thermal equilibrium and then they go out of equilibrium, but essentially the crucial thing is that the neutrons decay, a free neutron decays. It has a lifetime of 885 seconds and it decays with that lifetime. Once the energy falls below the neutron proton energy scale, it decays off. Okay. So, the neutrons decay and then once, so the neutrons essentially combine with the protons to give deuterons, deuterons then uh, deuteron deuteron collision takes place and you get helium or tritium and then the helium uh, or tritium they react with the deuteron or neutron uh, with the proton or neutron to give you helium 4 and the whole process doesn't proceed much beyond helium 4 there are small traces of lithium which are left over but besides that it mainly stops at helium 4 so at the end of nucleosynthesis what you have <coughs> If you really want a nutshell summary, at the end of nucleosynthesis, what you have is that one fourth by weight by weight has gone into roughly one fourth by weight has gone into helium four. The remaining three fourth by weight is in hydrogen protons. Okay, these are all nuclei. They're not. They're not. The atoms have not formed. Remember, just the nuclei. The energy is so high. 10 to the power 9 Kelvin of the order of 10 to the power 9 Kelvin that the atoms do not form. You just have the nuclei forming. Okay. So, you have the helium 4 nuclei, you have protons essentially and there are small traces of, <coughs> of deuterium and helium 3 and uh, beryllium, uh, lithium 7. Okay, that is all that you have. Now, you may be wondering where does the rest of the material, so the universe started off with protons and neutrons. If you go even before that, we believe, we know, we now have belief, reasons to believe that the protons and neutrons are themselves made up of quarks, quarks and quarks have been bound to form protons and neutrons. If you go even further back, where the energy is more than that binding energy, then the protons and neutrons themselves are not there you will get a quark gluon plasma. So, you will have quarks essentially in the universe. Okay, protons, the binding energy of a proton, the temperature of the universe is more than that, so it cannot exist. Okay. So, this is the way we proceed. Now, if you find that in future somebody finds that uh, the quark itself is not the basic particle, it is made up of something else, then those, if you go to higher temperatures, those will be there. Okay. So, that is the basic picture. So, as you go further and further back, things which have a binding energy less than the temperature, the temperature keeps on increasing. If the things that have a binding energy less than the temperature, they get dissociate associated. Okay. So, at a temperature of around 10 to the power 9 Kelvin, you form, you form the nuclei. Cosmological nucleosynthesis occurs. So, you form the nuclei and you only end up forming these nuclei, nothing much more. The rest of the nucleosynthesis, now if you look around us, so you had these protons, neutrons and they have formed these nuclei. If you look around us, you find that the earth on earth you have carbon, <coughs> oxygen, right? without carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, you would not have life on earth, carbon and oxygen, not only hydrogen by itself would not have done the job. Okay, so, there are a large other number of other elements which you find on earth. So, you may be wondering where did these come from. I have briefly mentioned this already. All of these were synthesized in stars, not all of these, sorry, inside stars. So, much later, this is something that we shall do, much later you had the, so the epoch when we are talking about there are no stars, there is just some gas. Okay. Now, much later this whole, some in some places the gas collapses to form stars. 
galaxies and stars. Inside stars, you have fusion taking place. So, more helium gets produced and there the re reaction proceeds further, carbon is produced okay. and it proceeds further, it proceeds all the way up to iron. The binding energy per nucleon peaks at iron. So, in equilibrium you cannot produce beyond iron. So, I have also told you how elements beyond iron are produced, they are produced in supernova. In supernova there are very high neutron fluxes. So, these elements iron <laughs> they it absorbs neutron and goes over to heavier elements okay, and it decays and then uh, there are a chain of reactions by which all the other elements beyond iron are formed. So, up to iron are formed inside nuclei, inside the stars in thermal equilibrium, beyond iron they are formed in out of thermal equilibrium and supernovas. Okay, and so, when the supernova explodes, so what is formed in the star would remain there, but fortunately the stars have a finite life. So, when the star forms a supernova, it explodes, all the material is spilled into the interstellar medium and from that medium you have planets forming, you have stars forming. So, the medium is continuously getting, interstellar medium is continuously getting re enriched. Okay. So, let me stop the uh, discussion of nucleosynthesis here. In the next lecture, we shall move on to another topic.